Well, boys, this is the moment that my long journey has been leading up to. All this time of re-experiencing my favorite web show, picking up on new things I didn't notice before, stealing points made by other people that already did the work before me, was all started during this run of death battle. And now, we've reached the end. God damn it. We got some good content ahead of us, so let's not waste too much time here. Season 8 didn't bring any super ultra major innovations or anything like that. They started listing off the combatants' names before the connections, and Ringmaster replaced the KO announcer. Wow, epic. No, no, no. The real reason Season 8 is a big deal is because of all the thematic and enticing matchups with tons of history with the Death Battle show, Korra vs. Storm notwithstanding. You see, Death Battle started on December 7, 2010, and it turned 10 years old at the tail end of Season 7. You know, the yummy year. So screw it, rather than just having a time celebration let's just make a whole season be the celebration arguably it's a more dangerous position now because season seven also had a ton of promise and that ended up being as a series punching bag so what if this season also had a sour reputation we got some good all right rules yep there they are all right let's go Okay, okay, I know that making every matchup a big boy balls to the wall episode in really any season is a tall order. And I also get that some matchups are more thematic than others. But sometimes, Mr. Battle, I see you. When you and the boys decide that you need some Akuma versus Shao Kahn, my god, we're gonna get some Akuma versus Shao Kahn action tonight. Their summary before the analysis literally boils down to these two are final bosses. Who's gonna win? They're not hiding it, and I can kind of respect that, actually. The analysis. Well, I like how they referenced Akuma would never never smack a baby, and I appreciate how they dove into new territory unlike the last batch of Mortal Kombat episodes. Other than that, that's it. Okay, but for real though, Pit Wiz and Boomstick in a twerking competition covered in oil, who would win? The audience. Okay, the fight. Now, this is musty. Yup, this is another fight that solely focuses on hand-to-hand -hand combat given to a team that has already proven to not do that super well. Okay, first off, the SFM team is now the Blender team and Devil Artemis left the band to do his own thing and then to poke his head here and there. Well, that's not super important. I at least want to give credit where it's due. It is an improvement. And that's it. There's still some classic funny janky bits like Akuma's jump, Akuma's mostly sluggish combos, whatever this is, this Shoryuken, man. Visually speaking, this kind of stinks. Desert settings have never really wowed me, but at least sometimes they have something going on. But here there's like a single stone thingy, maybe a big stone thingy if you're lucky. Not helped by Shao Kahn's smelly model and Akuma looks good, but his Shin Akuma cum hair has no shading to it. And Oni, well, you know what? Let's go ahead and go over why this fight landed in dead last. The nosedive it took when Akuma transformed. It's pretty cool and stupid. It's cool because of Akuma's line and the way Philip Sacramento delivered it. This shot of Oni's eyes through the smoke. The music finally kicking in. And it's stupid because of Oni's goofy punch. His model looking like he's three feet tall. And generally, Akuma just deciding to give in to the Satsui no Hado after spending most of the fight getting obliterated. Eh. Oni decides to punch Shao Kahn's titties a bunch and like... What? At least for the earlier combos, there were like, you know, hit effects. Here, they're either too subtle or just not there at all. Oni's fireballs have no transitions to them. They just pop in, but somehow Shao Kahn's goofy green shield looks even worse. Oni punching a hole through Khan's chest. Wow. We then get a raging demon that starts off looking like trash with Oni's carpal tunnel and the Verdana font kanji, but it actually looks pretty cool. And then we get Shao Kahn's lens flare meme eyes that melts the already melted scenery, and then Oni dies in three hits. Complete with a first person, but not really first person, but still technically off screen for a Mortal Kombat kill shot, kill shot. Cool. The animation isn't totally without its merits. Both uses of the Raging Demon are cool, and I just like how they use both the classic and modern interpretations. Uh, the music when it reaches its high point is honestly among the most underrated tracks of the show. Look, something had to land last year, and this was not a difficult decision. At least as of this season, it is now the best worst episode. A title that I previously gave to Aang vs. Ed when I was probably really sleepy when I wrote that or something. Because at least Thanos vs. Darkseid tried to do cool stuff and not the most wretched writing I'd ever seen. Actually, there's one last thing I just thought of. If you took from Akuma and Shao Kahn's previous death battles and pit those two guys together... Huh, not only is M. Bison vs. Shang Tsung more thematic, somehow, but it would probably be better for the Blender team as a result. Anyway... When I said I had this list ranked and ready to go, I had a couple folks more interested to see what I put above Dead Last rather than on it. On the one hand, makes sense. But on the other hand, really now. Blake versus Mikasa was almost scientifically engineered through a microscope for me to not care. Right, so analysis. Boomstick solves racism. Happy for ya. Wiz has a million clones and I gotta admit, that's horrifying. They also spent a good chunk of the analysis making fun of Adam and honestly, based. Blake's was decent, but nothing like earth shattering or anything. So let's move on to Mikasa's and um... Uh, 
Yeah, this is probably the worst rundown of the season. Not in regards of character coverage, but none of the jokes really, like, worked, and they dedicated a whole cutaway to a fart joke. I hate it here. This fight is a battle between Blake and Mikasa, and if that's all you're expecting going in, then prepare to have your socks blown off. This was Torian's last fight on the show, for real this time. Maybe. I mean, sure, I could be like, man, it sure is disappointing that this was his last outing, but sometimes things just work out like that. I'm not gonna act like it's anyone's fault. With that said, man, I get the vision with Blake and Mikasa animated on twos while everything else is animated on ones, but sometimes they're also animated on ones because, yes, I guess I get it. Choppy animation can work in a 3D setting, any spider versers and puss and boosters in chat, but those work because it's intentional with the art styles. Here, no. Yes, I will aware how stupid it is to compare a three-minute fight animation to million-dollar budget films, but that doesn't make the sudden changing animation styles mid-shot not distracting. Which is also a shame because there is quality. They get to zip and flip and dip and zip and flip all over the place. And there are cool moments like Mikasa fighting while upside down and Blake shoving Mikasa through a whole building. I'll even get points to the death for having some cool buildup like Blake's arm getting cut off as a callback to Yang's. And Blake redirecting the Thunder Spear in spite of missing an arm was the coolest thing I think I've ever seen Blake do, canon or otherwise. But there's also moments like the funny runny, this shot, and the rest of the death with the memed up Mikasa whale and the fact that it's another wide shot explosion death. How... Dank, dude. Writing-wise, Are those two sets of ears? She must have four times the hearing. It's not all bad. It's just totally overshadowed by that. Blake ignoring Mikasa trying to save her life and picking a fight as a result. And Blake smiling and eager to fight a titan despite having no aura, one arm, and the fact that a titan is approaching. I can at least give props to making Mikasa the strategist, almost like a main character in this animation. But the fact Eren couldn't record new lines for Blake and they had to rely on existing voice clips for her, she feels significantly more lifeless and robotic, which already doesn't help the Blake has no personality stigma people have clinged to for some reason. Hands down, the best aspect of this episode is the custom track Thunder Shroud. It goes crazy and I love it. But give me the choice between the two to revisit and... Yeah, that said, I do feel a little bad though. You could argue the main reason this episode even happened was because of one dude, and even in spite of the majority of other rankings placing this episode so low, the fact that he was able to see his most wanted matchup happen and still enjoy it is very heartwarming. I just wish I liked it more, but oh well. Hey, hi, hope you're enjoying the video so far, but I'm sorry, I gotta annoy you for a sec. I'm trying to help raise money for my partner who owes a lot of it to a stinky college they dropped out of, and we need your help. Let me just say, if you aren't able to donate or just don't want to, totally cool. I'd rather you worry about yourself first, though if I'd ask just one thing, just share the link around. Quick, easy, free, pat yourself on the back. Good job, thank you. But if you do want to donate, first of all, thank you so much. It would mean the world to both of us. You can either do so directly through the GoFundMe, or if you want some sweet digital type goodies or an extra reason to donate some money, you can always use my membership program. All YouTube money I make goes directly through the GoFundMe anyway, and you can always cancel later down the line to keep your perks for the rest of the month and not have it auto bill. I also do live streaming events and premieres to all of the scripted content for like a live chat experience and to interact with my fan base whenever I'm not lazy or stupid. If we meet the final stretch goal by July 31st, 2024, I will do a 24-hour live stream. I don't know how or what I will do, but I will do it. Thank you for your time. Now let's get back to the video. You see, this is the spot you guys should have been speculating about. But I guess I'm glad you didn't because... Oh, yeah. Yep, we're already here. Out of all the episodes in this season to spark the most ire out of the community, not Madara vs. Aizen, not Dio vs. Alucard, not the one where Dragon Ball's winning streak ended. No, no, no. Macho Man vs. Kool-Aid Man was the episode that caused the most controversy of the season. I love it here! Well, before we get into the walking nightmare, I want to make it clear that this episode... It's pretty good. It does the cool different thing of being cool and different from traditional episodes, as in the entire episode is built around a story. Okay, okay. It technically takes place in the fight animation, and that's neat as F. They talk about Macho Man, and these analysis screens are such an eyesore, and I love it. They gave the amazing comic book editing to the freaking Kool-Aid Man of all characters. Jocelyn finally makes her debut to the show, too. And yeah, it's short, sweet, to the point, and even continues during the fight, like Wiz and Boomstick are debating about the match as Macho Man and Kool-Aid Man are fighting, and that's pretty cool. And the animation itself is pretty neat. It uses all the abilities they talk about in fun ways. The custom track is fun. They reference the creation of Adam, and that's pretty cool. And now it's a stop-motion claymation battle! What? It's so vibrant and awesome and creative and was spoiled by Luis on Twitter before the episode dropped, F, but it's still amazing regardless. It all culminates to Kool-Aid Man trapping Macho Man in his pitcher and gets slurped up. I gotta ask, what are you doing later? But remember, Kool-Aid Man is not just the pitcher, but the Kool-Aid too. So he manipulates the Kool-Aid to... 
blow up a hole in Macho Man's chest. Uh-oh. So yeah. God damn it. I'm not about to sit here and act like people are wrong to be uncomfortable over this. Obviously, Randy Poffo was an influential figure and his death was very tragic. So animating a death like this? Ish. In fact, I'll even play devil's advocate and say it was kind of amazing that this was missed by the dozens of people that worked on this episode. I mean, I get it's easy to get lost in the art sometimes, but holy freaking crap. Now with that said, the reaction was abhorrent. It's one thing to be like, hey, 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 but it's another to treat the death battle team like villainous scumbags over what is ultimately a mistake. A really unfortunate mistake, but a mistake nonetheless. Like if they really wanted to talk some middle school playground smack on Randy Savage's legacy, you'd think they'd do way more than, oh, I don't know, respecting him in the analysis and furthermore, resurrecting him and acting like he and the Kool-Aid man do this all the time? Now the real question is, what is this episode doing so freaking low? Dad? Dad? Yeah, so all this controversy, all this nonsense the death battle team and the community had to deal with, it was all on the foundation over a boomstick dad joke. A joke that stopped being funny ages ago, and don't just take my word for it. We have been setting up this joke, this like dark bit with boomstick for years with his father, right? Yeah. Uh, and the joke's gotten old. <laughs> <laughs> it got yeah. old like five years ago. Hey, hi, this is a very EP post-production tie here. I just now realized I'm taking Ben out of context and making him look a little silly for centering an episode around a joke that he said has gotten old when he goes on a very reasonable explanation for it. The short version of it is that it's like so well established, you know, like the boomstick dad joke they did like 40 million times. So it's like, we know it's a thing and that it's like, you know, the literal 150th episode of the 10th anniversary season. So it's like, you know what? Sure, why not? Why not? Let's go a little crazy, a little, little, little silly, a little, little kooky even. Also, if you're wondering why I'm recording a whole last tangent that annihilates the flow of this video when I don't even do that for like minor flub ups and use text to speech instead. I, do, uh. Ringmaster thinks he's found Boomstick's dad and Randy waits till he's seconds from death to tell him that no, he's not his dad. Thanks, dude. Deadpool shows up. And then we actually get a pretty touching reunion between Boomstick and his mom and a nice lesson about how it's okay if things don't turn out the way you expect and sometimes the best things in life are right in front of you, aka found family. Profound morals are at best a rarity in death battle, so I thought this was really sweet and touching. And then we end on one last joke where Sarge is just so conveniently a few feet away and ponders if he has a son, even though five seasons ago they implied he did. Epic retcon, I guess. Yeah, um... I said this episode was good, but it's also a mess. The good stuff is good. And ultimately, I respect them tying a knot to the stupid Boomstick Dad arc, I guess, and holding their word about not making another Boomstick Dad joke again. It has pretty solid writing and animation too. However, all the baggage surrounding this episode and the fact an episode that would have been a great standalone episode is shackled by the Boomstick Dad joke nightmare scenario, disappointment of the season, hands down. It's not the episode's fault, but sometimes things just are the way they are. <sighs> okay, anything else? Oh, I just now noticed Boomstick's MoMA tattoo. I'm more of a Guggenheim kind of guy, but I respect it. Look, it's not that I'm too lazy to write an introduction to peak masterpiece cinema Lex Luthor vs. Doctor Doom, but rather it's so peak and so masterpiece and so cinema that it needs no introduction. I haven't even wrote the YouTube description yet and I already know I'm gonna reference it. For real, when Doctor Doom was teased to be one of the combatants of season 8, I was stoked. I love Doctor Doom and thought his first episode was so mid and did next to nothing to show how absolutely sick he is. And then they pin him against Lex Luthor and like... I was flipping mad and pissed and upset when this was announced, and at first I thought the episode was absolutely mid. Of course, I've mellowed out, and after its time has passed, I can say that my opinion of this episode has improved. It's one spot higher than I originally planned. It goes without saying that the editing and the analysis is godlike. Dare I say, a little too godlike. All the bright, glowy effects and keyframing and sound effects are so good, it's honestly a little abrasive. Like, it kind of distracts from the commentary a little bit. Then again, is that really a bad thing when the actual discussion is like, Eh. Lex's analysis at least brought up new stuff. Doom's was like mostly the same, so there really wasn't much I got out of the actual character discussion. Now for the fight. Your company has invaluable resources for the people of Latveria. I will be seizing them. It's fine and dandy. It's got decent choreography. They use most of their funky gadgets. Like, it's not like I'm left wanting for more. 
it's that I'm left kind of wanting to go to the next episode. Both Lex and Doom stop the fighting a lot to explain their abilities that we just learned about. On one hand, yes, it's in character with their gigantic cocks and egos. On the other hand, I don't care. It just pads the runtime more than anything else. As for any other standout moments I can think of, positive. I like that they reference the foot dive combo and take it further by having Doom do a Marvel vs. Capcom combo and then get severely punished for whiffing. If they were going to reference the foot dive again, go all out with it and then just one measly kick and yeah, I'm really glad they did. Negative. Why is Dr. Goddamn Doom so befuddled over Lex having a backup suit? He is more than aware of Iron Man's existence, even took the mantle, so like like, positive. They also do the Man of Steel slash Injustice 2 Super slash Goku vs. Superman 2 slash Dear God, they use the sequence everywhere, don't they? But it was pretty cool. Negative. This. <laughs> You're not in Dorkly. You're dead. Positive. Aside from that, the death is good. Doom using the mind transfer to stab Lex with his own hand and switch back is at least a big brain play, and pinning Lex to the rebar and exploding him in that whole building was pretty cool. Negative. This last line referencing one of Doom's most iconic quotes was so phoned in, I nearly peed. So yeah, now it was Lex versus Doom. I don't know what you expected me to say about it. It happened, and we all gotta deal with it. At least it just goes in one ear and out the other, as opposed to having so much baggage that I just want to end my life. So props to Lex versus Doom for doing that. So Death Battle Season 7, great time to be alive, yes. I gave my entire spiel about comic book matchups before, but if you need the short version of it again, yes, they were all extremely excessive, but now that it's not 2020 anymore and they relented, let's pump the brakes a little bit before we decide what matchups are bad just because they feature a Marvel and or DC character or not. Oh, I don't know, any of these? They can still be cool and thematic and exciting regardless of how one-sided they can be, and Korra vs. Storm is not that, but it is a good episode. Imagine, you're a year off of season seven, and now they're still doing a comic book character at least every third episode, and it features another Avatar character. Need I say more? So yeah, surprise hit of season eight, which is astonishing that I'm already throwing that label when we're not even a quarter of the way through this ranking. Course analysis was fine. There were a billion calcs in there, but it was all discussed within context, so I don't mind it that much. They made another Captain Planet joke. The cutaway happened. It's fine. Storm's analysis, meanwhile, was good. It had funny jokes and no scaling because there was really no way she was going to lose this fight. So sure, just go over everything she herself has done and then just save the other feats for future episodes. This fight is pretty darn epic. Doesn't really have a lot of super standout moments. There were a few things I wish were worked in better, like Storm's claustrophobia. Storm getting kicked into the spirit realm was confusing to witness. The choreography, for the most part, isn't a lot to write home about either, but there are plenty of things this fight has going for it to make it not a season 7 table scrap. Easily the fight's strongest aspect is the visuals. The 3D backgrounds are stunning. The Sprites are well utilized, the effects are pretty friggin' epic. Easily the best shot when Storm pulls a Moses, like, lord, they are blurring the line more and more between sprite animation and 3D animation, like, holy heck. And there's a ton of cute little funny moments, like Korra's dinky little finger motion, the Cabbage Merchant actually getting a funny moment where even in the friggin' spirit realm he's not safe, and easily the most iconic aspect of the fight is Storm's reaction to the spirit realm. We get cameos of previous death battle losers, one of which is a death battle content creator. That's so cool. Cool, even if Nemesis Bloodreich had to die to get there. What happened? Range Rover? And the death is awesome, like they build up to the literal last shot with the revving sound effect and the screen shakes to deliver a gruesome headshot. Like it's one of those deaths where the anticipation is better than the execution, I think, but it all comes together anyway. Good episode. It was neat. All right, next. You want to talk about one of the most agonizing waiting periods for the show? Peep this. So season 7 introduced a gap in the middle of the season, which in a way can stir up some hype for the show's return. Season 7 left us with Beerus, and there were a smorgasbord of potential matchups with him. So stirring up tons of discussion throughout the summer was the best idea. I wonder how they're going to follow through in season 8. Oh, yeah, if Batman vs. Iron Man was, like, in the midst of either half, that makes sense. And sure, it's a matchup between two of the most iconic characters from Marvel and DC, so I would get why they'd want to do this. But the problem is that Batman was already in three other episodes, so there was zero speculation behind the matchup. There was more speculation over which suits they were going to give to Batman, but that all went down the drain when they just casually name-dropped the final bat suit and then just moved on immediately. And look, I'm not inherently against a character appearing so many times on the show, and I put invisible air quotes around that because 4 out of 148 barely amounts to 3%, so I'm not going to act like he's been on the show a ginormous amount. That's a little cringe. But what is also a little cringe is that it feels as Batman appears in more and more episodes, he just uses 
uses less and less of his kit. And the underutilization is what ultimately landed this episode at this spot. Iron Man, he does just about what I'd expect and then some. He's got the army, the nano suit. I didn't even know about the escape and soul's hammer. So that was fun to learn about. Batman uses like two gadgets and then goes into the hell bat. This is the only leg up his episode with Black Panther is going to get over this, just so we're clear. And, um... Aside from that, this episode kind of slaps. Well, at least the setup and everything after the Watchtower, just so we're clear. It starts off with Batman listening to the funny J-pop again. Never mind, all is right with the world. And there's actually like an in-universe reason as to why Tony would barge in wanting the Watchtower to be shut down and Bruce trying to keep it up. By just casually name dropping Captain America, Black Widow, and Superman, it immerses us into this completely made up scenario where the Avengers and Justice League exist simultaneously. Like they didn't have to do that, but it's cool and better than someone just sneezing a decibel too loud and then bloodshed. And then Batman just decides to throw the watchtower at Tony and send them all careening down the planet. Cool shot, but why did you do that? But once they're on Earth, the real fight starts. They made a neck crack look satisfying. How and why I need answers. It's just cool moment after cool moment from here on out. Them repeating their I am lines was sick. Tony showing up with all the boys. The sequence of the hell bat morbing all over the boys. This. Bust this. The soul's hammer shot. And even when it's all said and done, they duke it out in their base forms only for Tony to reveal one last trick which nets him the win. Complete with Batman's goofy skeleton just standing there. You love to see it. Yeah, I know my list of positives was just summarizing the rest of the fight, but that's because it's epic. What are you gonna act surprised that I don't have many profound takeaways from the second Marvel vs. DC fight of the season that also featured characters previously on Death Battle? You better not. Mewtwo vs. Shadow the Black Plague of Death Battle. So when Shadow vs. Ryuko was soft confirmed to be a thing before the season began, needless to say, it was kind of fair to be concerned. So imagine it being considered an accomplishment that they didn't screw it up. I mean, sure, this was right at the point where Death Battle really started to emphasize character writing, so I wouldn't have expected the deepest of deep dives, but on the other hand, would you imagine if they tried that again in the year of our Lord 2021? God. The analyses were kind of all over the place. On one hand, you have your usual good blend of character and versus garbage. That department's all fine and good, but you also have your classic boomstick dad joke, a cutaway that amounts to, ooh, nice ring, buddy. Hey, did you know I'm divorced? And Wiz explaining in detail about the metaphors of puberty and like, Okay, I get why they wanted to put that in. Part of discussing art is coming up with interpretations, and I'm not gonna sit and act like it's a bad one. It's just that I have to listen to it from the man that brought us Fire Daddy. And it'd be one thing if we got a decent punchline out of that, but... Wiz, do you have a daughter? No. I thought so. Huh? So the fight, and my my, what a mixed bag. I'm not gonna act like I didn't like it, it's the top 10, but don't get me wrong, the negatives are just as plentiful as the positives. Visually, they started the sprite animations this season bangerly. No overly crazy 3D environments, sure, but a city at Sunfall is a close second, and it being the first sprite fight since my sleep paralysis demon, Ryoko's rigging isn't the literal worst thing ever. Cool! Though they do that thing again where they just paste tiny mouth sprites and it just doesn't match at all and I don't like it. Audio-wise, I mean, the backing track Chaos Unraveled is a banger and a half if you ignore some of the lyrics in the verses, but the sound design overall is kinda dog. Some hits just don't feel like they really hit. It's not the worst in this show, but it's not great. At least the voice acting is good. Jello Apocalypse of Shadow? How? And Jenny Yokobori and Tom Laughlin are good as Ryuko and Sinkets. Character portrayals are certainly so. Shadow's at least not melting the scenery with stupid one-liners and instead gives short, blunt responses. Good, good, good. He even gets some cute little moments like him tossing his gun away before even using it. Calling the Kisaragi a faker is an amazing double reference, not just the fact that a golden super form is in front of him, but also to his fight against Vegeta. And he even says, I'm the coolest. We love to see that. Meanwhile, what happened with Ryuko? I mean, I kind of get why she mainly acts like how she started in the show, but after all that talk about her upbringing and the fact that she has all her in-game powers kind of makes it pretty weird. Doubly so how she just doesn't acknowledge Sinkets, even when they're seconds away from death, and even if she does, she's just butting heads. At least a lot of the action is pretty cool. They do a bunch of speedy, flippy-dippy zippiness and go all throughout the city and even go cosmic. I love how they use Chaos Control to call back to Sonic 06 and his fight against Mewtwo while also not completely annihilating the pace of the fight. He just does it and then immediately moves on. That's so cool. For some reason, I also really like Super Shadow's transformation. It stops the music to focus on Shadow's line and hearing the chorus again as the scream booms and flashes of his power waves, it's a strangely epic moment. And sure, Ryuko does have her trademark kill, kill transformations and cutaways. I always found it weird that they just stick with sprites for a final transformation. I don't know if it was a time or budget restraint or what, but 
Eh, already talked about the callbacks in this fight, but of course the obligatory one was Shadow's opponent saying sayonara right before the killing blow. On the one hand, I wish Shadow got to say, since he's the one who's about to win, but you can argue Shadow winning at all is enough of a twist anyway, so I can't be fussed. That said, the death is a little lame. It's another explosion death, and while the explosion looks cool, it's just that it moves on way too quickly, and for a big final piss-off attack, Shadow just sounds so bored delivering it. Yeah, the fight has a lot of meh qualities to it, but I liked all the good stuff enough to put it this high up. Now let's see how long it takes for Wiz to stop talking about miners. Oh, great! I'm gonna pretend like I have something really funny or insightful to build up to me talking about Steven Universe versus Star Butterfly like I have any personal investment into the matchup at all. I mean, no offense, I hear Steven Universe is good and I hear Star versus the Forces of Evil was good. It was just one of those matches I wasn't really into, but I know a lot of people are and you know what? That's great. If you couldn't already tell, didn't much care for these analyses, but hands down the weirdest choice to make was casually dropping the most important calculation for the fight in the middle of Steven's backstory before he was even named or shown. Imagine at the beginning of this video, I was like, Death Battle Season 8 is a really good season, so much so that Dio versus Alucard ended up as my favorite. Like, why would I do that? Now, I had worries going into the fight, mainly because one character is a pacifist and the other is definitely not that. So, in my mind, the fight had a chance to go one of two ways. Either they pull an Aang versus Ed and do pretty well with handling the pacifism up until they decide to crash and burn at the very end, or focus too much on the pacifism where it comes off as bullying Steven for not wanting to fight. With all their cards on the table, I thought they did the best they could. He's reluctant to fight, but knows he kind of has to, and mainly plays on defense until Star's transformation, where, uh, oh geez. Which, if I may, this transformation Best scene in the whole animation. The effects, Caden Jensen's bone chilling delivery, the build up, holy heck. And it gets even more epic because I hear it also references his trauma against another crystal gem that just so happens to resemble yellow diamonds. And if that's the case, uh, Jesus. Oh, yeah. And I guess while I also just mentioned the voice acting, I got to give props to Corrine Sudberg's performance as Star. It was also really good. I just have no other place to mention it. Okay, cool, great. I really like the tone of the fight. Sure, in the latter half, it gets eek ouch oof with a freaking army battle. But even still, the fight is so bubbly and different and cool. And the backing track, Stars of the Universe, also helps in that. It really does feel like two children trying to kill each other on the beach. There's also a bunch of neat little moments too, like Steven talking to the little watermelon guys, any second with Spider with a top hat on screen, them working in Steven's different perception of time. This hexagon shield shot goes crazy. And again, the bright colors and sound effects makes this fun to sit through. In spite of some meh negatives, this hand-to-hand -hand section is kind of rough, but it doesn't last long, and I imagine they needed something to break from all the projectile spam, so I'm okay with it existing. Steven's transformation was awesome. Stars was also cool, but it kind of just happened. Like, she got her comeuppance for destroying Steven's sandcastle, and the second it happens to her, no peace has gotta die! And I have such mixed feelings about the death. Like, the concept of Star having to figure out her win con after staff disappears, and all the effects are nice and pretty, it's just yet another laser death almost identical to Ryuko's. And in spite of it being Star's character of just killing a bunch of things and stuff, and just being all like, hey, let's be quirky about it, it's still a punchline I could have figured out five weeks in the womb. But yeah, cool fight. I just liked half the season more than it. Crazy, huh? The worst thing about Iron Fist vs. Poe is that it's called Iron Fist vs. Poe and not Poe vs. Iron Fist. Terrible show. Unsubscribed. So here's a fun fact for ya. In all of Death Battle's 10 years up to this episode's release, they had never had a character from an animated film series before. They pulled from animation, and they pulled from movies, but no animated movies! Okay, technically you can argue Beerus and Broly count since they debuted in movies, but that's like referring to Dragon Ball as an animated film series in the same league as like Pixar and DreamWorks. I gotta question your categorization skills. I don't know how it took them so long, but here we are. The analyses were pretty good, if only because it was really nice to see them cover Kung Fu Panda with everything they've learned about writing not hellish analyses. And for what it's worth, Iron Fist's analysis was good too. Him being a Marvel character means the editing is of course gonna be amazing, and I really like the recurring comments about how yikes that one Hiroshima comparison was, and they made it pretty epic. Plus, they also don't make the obvious punchline of the Iron Fist Netflix show being the Iron Fist Netflix show, so props for that too. This fight is like the most massive love letter to Kung Fu Panda. Poe and his antics absolutely stole the show. So many fun references to his movies, like countering Danny's hypnosis by imagining him as a dumpling, falling down the stairs for a million years, briefly calling back to his bamboo stilt fight 
fighting career, even going as far as repeating his Wushi finger hold dialogue with his fight against Tai Lung, only for Danny to react with the utmost confusion and lack of shit giving. Like, they're obvious references, but they're worked in so naturally, and it's the kind of references that appeal more to a general audience as opposed to something like really niche and specific like JoJo's or even Star Wars prequels. I don't know a single person bothered by this, and if you are, you're not real. Everything also comes together with Austin Lee Matthews' phenomenal performance as Poe. The idea of Death Battle booking Jack Black for a death battle is... Well, it might not be as impossible as you might think, but still pretty impossible. But they got basically the only other person on the planet to play the part. But don't think for a second that this just makes it the Poe show featuring Iron Fist. Which is a point that a lot of people seem to be making lately, and man, have I done nothing to convince people that that's an overdone statement. Because Iron Fist... It's also pretty cool. When they're fighting with the bamboo, Poe counters Danny by eating it, only for Danny to anticipate that and knee him in the face, which is the most alpha thing ever. Danny also gets a moment that, despite being blinded by the Golden Lotus Clap, does the sickest one-inch punch of death battle history. It's so meaty and impactful and mm! And the two of them are like a perfect fit for each other. Classic case of, hey, you're cool. I like you. Let's do a friendly spar. All right, let's take it up a notch because we're in a death battle. Okay, you can die now. With everything nice I've had to say, it's kind of hard to believe that I like seven episodes more than this one. But if I can find something to complain about, the ending, eh. The two golden glowy dragons fighting is near breathtaking, and Poe even gets one last moment to focus on the iron dumpling. Okay, this should have an awesome payoff. Or Poe can just yoink himself into Danny as he evaporates, and his immediate reaction to all this is, oh, that was awesome. I'm going to tell Master Shifu about how I killed a man. And like, man, fun time all around still, but thanks to the idiot talking to you today, we still have a lot more to cover. You know, as hellish as Macho Man vs. Kool-Aid Man was for centering its entire episode over the Boomstick Dad joke, I'm at least glad it was like, the end of it. Because earlier in the season, Heihachi Mishima vs. Geese Howard happened, and when it was announced, the common reaction was, please god no, please god no, please god no, please god no, but it only had two of them. Yeah, right? Only two! It also had a 30 second tangent about Elon Musk that had nothing to do with anything. That's death to my soul. It also had Boomstick say, Salty run back. And, Scrub Lord. Like, dude, you're pushing retirement. It also had Boomstick make two jokes about Heihachi's asshole, and Wiz technically made one too. And I don't know what to make of any of that. But you know what the analysis also had? Oh, I love it. Anyways, the fight is pretty pog champ. It's a classic case of awesome consistency. Not many super high peaks, but nope, super low valleys that I can think of off the top of my idiot head. It's just a fun time all around. I like Ringmaster serving as the fighting game announcer here and giving another tiny little lore dump to Mesh Tekken and King of Fighters together just for this one animation. It's also the first time someone said fight since the seven battle royale. So that's... Yeah, the audio side of things is yes. Kings of Iron is so cool and catchy, and I love how it starts off as a King of Fighters type track with a classic sound font, only to turn into a Tekken techno jam. It's great. In regards to voice acting, the fact that Yoshia Mao voices Heihachi strictly in Japanese, and Brent Mukai voices Geese in broken English, is more than enough proof that Death Battles improved their character studying skills in between seasons, but I can give you more. They play into Heihachi's rushdown playstyle and Geese's reliance on counterplay super well, to the point where they made Geese's predictable bit a running gag, and they divert it twice with the don't say it bit, and Heihachi also getting to say predictable. The hoes are thriving tonight. And overall, yeah, it's just nice seeing two old men kill each other near a volcano set to a Tekken type beat, and it comes together in the latter half. They had the coolest wide shot in the entire season. I almost wish they did this more because it's so sick. Then they take a sec to breathe and hug it out. That's so sweet. Can they kiss and make out next? Or Heihachi can throw geese into the volcano. I reiterate, character studying is on point here. And it's also alpha as F for Heihachi's reaction to also getting yoinked to the volcano to prioritize geese's death over his own survival so that he doesn't even attempt to climb back up until he sees Geese's face getting melted off. Lord! Sure, it's a tad jarring to see the hard cut to hand-drawn animation, but it's a dude's face getting melted off. Like, come on. And the nice little cherry on top of Heihachi punching the camera. That was awesome. Good fight. Very good. Awesome. Amazing. Spectacular. This is the 80th time I've had to justify my placement saying I like the rest more. Oh dear. Oh geez. Oh my. All right, gamers, here's where the ranking gets kooky. I haven't said my classic catchphrase, this was the most difficult death battle ranking I've ever had to narrow down in a while, but like... Anyways, yeah, deciding my top six. Not great, because in my opinion, we're in the masterpiece zone, basically. Like, all these episodes are like, 
a 10 out of 10 at minimum. At one point or another, they've each taken the top spot. Except for what actually ended up as my number one pick, funnily enough, but we'll get there. I guess that's one benefit of taking two years to do death battle rankings. It lets each season simmer in my idiot head before I declare that Yoda versus King Mickey is my sixth favorite death battle season eight episode. You know, in case you were wondering. I remember being blown away when this episode first came out because holy heck, the quality comparison between this episode alone and the entire previous season is night and day. Season seven, Seven's got its peaks, and I still think it's better than most make it out to be, B -b but still! However, now that time has passed, I can say that this episode has the most wrinkles out of everything in the Masterpiece Zone. Analyses were pretty alright, phenomenal story coverage, particularly at the end of Yoda's where they cover his worst epic fails in the war efforts, only to make a point about how his failure was the greatest teacher for the right pupil and the next generation of Jedi. Like, that's awesome! It's a shame most of the jokes didn't really click, and Mickey's analysis in particular just felt shorter with how they just breeze through his skills and okayish cutaway and then just more highlights of his endeavors. I don't know, it was a little weird. Man, it's really awkward I labeled this as a 10 out of 10 when I didn't much care for the analysis, go me. But the fight is where things really kick into the high gear, but not before I continue being a nitpicky bitch. It's an SFM battle, which means that, yeah, it's gonna SFM all over the place with some shots like Yoda's lightsaber phasing through the fog, Mickey's nose, whatever this is. And as amazing as the final act is, which, oh, Boy, we're gonna get to! The actual killing blow being another wide shot explosion certainly is the most wide shot explosion yet, and um... Wow, we're in the top six, huh? I mean, it's an SFM fight that plays into all their strengths of using a billion flashy abilities and pretty environments. What do you want from me? Hearts of Light? Incredible. Sounds like it came directly from Kingdom Hearts, and it works in phenomenally well. Voice acting and dialogue? Also top notch. Philip Sacramento and Keston Howard as Yoda and Mickey have spot on impersonations. And it's just fun to see Yoda's backwards talk interact with Mickey's Mickey Mouse Clubhouse Mickey Mouse speak. Mickey in general has like a wider variety of expressions, which is astonishing giving that he always has a smile on his face, but they just made it work. It's just a fun showcase of two tiny men flipping and dipping and zipping all around, but the real show happens when Yoda tosses his lightsaber but not before smacking Mickey with a stick. That was fun. It's yet again another amazing showcase of character since Yoda puts all of his trust in the force as the music gets all choiry, and now Mickey's on the back foot. Yoda even gets a Doctor Strange all over the place. Now this really is the Disney battle. And how could I forget Yoda telling Mickey to surrender because he doesn't have the force on his side, only for Mickey to snap back saying he can try because all he needs is the light. All to work in the iconic do or do not line because I would be stupid to forget about that. And as much as I griped about the explosion, it's at least a different kind of explosion. It's all sparkly and stuff. But at the very end, they try to fake you out because Yoda's force ghost is still there, but he made it so playful and passes on like, haha, I had you for a second there, didn't I? I think one of the episode's biggest strengths is that there were no stupid memes in there. Like they could have easily put in the Lego Yoda death stream or constantly make jokes about the cute little rat guy just tied to corporate greed, ho ho. I mean, the most we get is what happened, but it's so subtly placed and made sense in context. So allow it. This was the last fight that the SFM team did together before they branched off, but for a final hurrah as a team with this janky-ass, Gmod-ass software, they pulled out all the stops. What a phenomenal episode, through and through. Saitama vs. Popeye barely cracked my top five. I could tell you I love Satan and I bet you that would have a less extreme reaction. So what in the F happened here? This is basically peak death battle and I only have it at this spot right here. I mean, I really wish I had a better answer other than I just like the rest more. But you know what? I'm putting the blame on you, viewer, for clicking on this video that took me weeks of scripting, recording, editing, processing, and publishing. Yeah, look at what you did! I promise you I'm not literally being different. This is just how I was made. I enjoyed these here analyses. It was fun fun learning more about One Punch Man and the cultural impact it had, and Popeyes was also enjoyable with them making fun of Popeyes usage of racial stereotypes, the funny blue screen spinach overlay, and for your own sake, eat your f***ing vegetables. You're not my mother, wizard. I'll all be darn diddly darn. A mixed media death battle. Sure, we've seen some hand-drawn moments in sprite fights these days. Even Macho Man vs. Kool-Aid Man had completely changed animation styles for an artistic decision, but we've never had a fight where that was the whole gimmick. 
huh the backbone of this fight is hand-drawn characters on 3d backgrounds which look fantastic it's that sweet spot of anime and cartoony on top of looking really pretty we get a sprite section and even the music goes all chip toony which feels like the death battle equivalent of those gamer shirts you see at target but it was still cool and we get a devil artemis animated segment where Oh, Goku Black versus Reverse Flash doesn't have SF and Popeye in it. Why is that episode above this one again? Going back to the anime and cartoon contrast point I glossed over. Yeah, anime and cartoon do contrast, huh? They get to show the wackier side of things, such as Popeye doing his Popeye thing and Saitama's world-famous meme face, and also the batshit crazy side of things, like the entire cosmic section. They pull off both sides of the coin very well, which I would hope so, given that this is, in fact, a crossover series. I love how Popeye even gets to be all confused over Kanji, only to just embrace it later. Later. It's not only funny, but somehow Popeye of all characters gets to have a character development. And on the note of character discussion, look, they wrote Saitama, a character famously extremely bored with anyone he fights, gets to slowly put more and more effort as the fight progresses, even gets excited after their fist clash, and a moment for the action to just slow down and to let him take the entire experience in. Even without dialogue, you can read exactly how Saitama is feeling solely through facial expressions and body language, but Ryan Abedi gets to pour his heart out in this performance. And a side note, the guy that wrote Ben 10 vs. Green Lantern did great as Popeye too. This moment right here epitomizes everything we all talk about when it comes to how important it is to understand the characters as characters. Granted, it is a challenge to write a believable interaction in a hypothetical fight to the death between two or more characters from completely different universes. I mean, as of this episode's upload, Saitama has never been given a canonical moment to truly embrace a battle the way he does here. I'm not gonna pretend something like this is an impossibility, but then pulling it off at all is still amazing. I completely understand the hype behind this episode. It's a moment that single-handedly shot this episode up to Death Battle's Hall of Fame, and I can see why it deserves to be at the top of anyone's list of favorite episodes of this season let alone of all time. Man, that would have been a great note to end off the video with, huh? Thank Christ they redid this one. Link vs. Cloud the original was a good episode and all, but it was also way too big for their britches. Death Battle hadn't been around for that long, and now they're gonna try a 3D animation with tons of flippy dippy sword combat and abilities? Good freaking luck! Season 5 introduced the concept of, just do it again, with Mario vs. Sonic, and now that we have Link vs. Cloud the, the new, new to continue that trend, I love it! The analysis? Meh. Lynx was mainly just lists a bunch of stuff he's had in the games, and I get it, he's mostly a blank slate guy, but in comparison to the competition, it's not very compelling. His feats section doesn't list Puzzle Solver. This is off to a very rough start. Clouds was similarly in one ear, not the other, but they list off his magic before they even get to his background. Yeah, alright then. The fight? Good gracious. As I said before, Yoda vs. Mickey was the last fight done by the SFM team, but the guys themselves would still work on the show. Devil Artemis kinda just pops his head in occasionally, maybe helped out by another person, but everyone else switched over to Blender. Basically, this is the beginning of the Blender team as we call it now, consisting of everyone else plus a few more people. Even Luis would assist in this episode and contribute to future 3D fights because yeah, sure, can you quit being a multifaceted beast, my guy? Anyway, fight's epic. For the first foray into Blender, this is awesome. Has some blemishes, sure, like funky textures such as Link's Edo Tensei eyes and Cloud's flickering everything, and slightly janky animations, but I bring that up so much that it feels less like a point of criticism and more like an inevitability when working with 3D. Oof. The agenda here today is just shove as much gamey gamerness as you can in the ultimate junk food experience. I mean, Link and Cloud start off fighting on motorcycles and Link does the Akira slide, and that's just the opening act! There's a ton of fun swordplay and Link gets to bust out all the stops. Is it slightly jarring to see Breath of the Wild Link use the four sword, claw shot, magic cape, ocarina, and fierce deity mask? Yeah, a little. Is it awesome in spite of that and makes a combination of each non-Breath of the Wild kit, such as using said magic cape to vanish as an opportunity to not only seize the magic Master Sword, but to also play the Song of Swords to set up his Skyward Strike, which resulted in some of the most badass shots in the entire fight. Yeah, a little! Yeah, Link basically stole the show. We kinda knew going into this that Cloud's insanely strong, but they do a good job showing Link can hold his own. The dual time stops was awesome, the Four Swords segment was even better when they gave each individual Link their own personality, everything with the Song of Storms, the bone-chilling fierce deity transformation, and funny enough, Cloud is hardly faced by any of it. He looks more annoyed. So now you end up with two epic video game dudes throwing out all the stops and a dynamic of Link trying to overwhelm Cloud with all his funky gadgets while somehow making Cloud Strife an underdog victor in all of this, thanks mostly in part to his sheer might. And I appreciate the killing blow being 
you know, different out of anything in the first half of the season. That sound design too. Ugh. You see, this is why I love video game matchups so much because the player has access to a variety of tools and abilities in a gameplay setting. So it just makes it awesome when you see everything the player is using in a fight like this with tons and tons of potential for awesome moments. And this fight nailed it. Hands down my personal favorite 3D fight of the season, which is doubly more insane because I just now realized that this is the first time a sprite battle made it at the top of one of these rankings. Well, let's just see and find out which one did, huh? If there's one question I've gotten shockingly little, hey Ty, what's your most wanted death battle episode? That is a great question. I guess something involving a character from The World Ends With You or Neo, but considering the very specific circumstances they even fight, I don't know how death battle could make it work, but I'd love to see him try. Aside from that, like, Dude, my picks are boring. Wow, Ty, you wanna see Ash versus Yugi, Hellboy versus Nero, Bowser versus Eggman, Gru versus Megamind? Don't toss your panties quite yet. So instead of all of that garbage, I just normally go by season by season and for season eight, if there's any one episode I thought needed to happen, are you surprised I'm gonna say Modera versus Aizen? Like, come on now. Analyses? epic. Moderas had some noteworthy jokes and lines like Wiz going Charlie Day on Moderas plan and the iconic gas leak. Aizen's had some jokes in there, but it was nice to learn more about him and Bleach. It was neat. Kenpachi apparently has the power to annihilate Great Britain. Can he please be real? Now the fight. It was kind of rough at first. The setup is just big fire move. Aizen's hanging out. Madara walks in. Aizen trades away his prescription eyesight for hair gel while swinging his arms like a helicopter. And then they fight. The start of the sprite animations isn't the worst I've seen, but definitely the most noticeably wrinkly with the awkward side profiles and some wacky puppet rigging. Madara's left eye has an adventure with two instances where his eye is trying to escape a socket and Aizen's wings disappear for a shot. L L L L L L L. Like, I mean, it's not the most horrendous start to a fight. It helps that Hollow Dreams happens to be one of the best songs in the series, and Philip Sacramento continues his trend of giving amazing voice performances for Death Battle losers, and Nicholas Andrew Louis of all people proves his amazing range as Madara. But overall, the start of the fight really isn't top three worthy. Well, the moment Aizen transforms and swings his sword once to do all this fuck shit to the environment, I knew this was going to reward us with something really insane. And it would all begin when Aizen uses the Kuro Hitsugi. And in that time, Madara summons the Ten Tails just to become his Jinchuriki and the Meteor. It's easy to miss, but this Susanoo formation wasn't for the Ten Tails. Meaning, not only did Madara have all the time he needed to do all of this, and not only was it his goal to let himself get trapped in the Xbox Series X for his opportunity to get the upper hand on Aizen, but his first flex as a Ten Tail Jinchuriki was an attack he summoned in his base form. And that Meteor shot too, poof, perfectly captures what it's like to have a humongous Meteor in the sky. And they could have easily referenced the second one one bit, but turns out there were several actually. We get a brief aerial scuffle and suddenly eyes in a sandwich between two rocks. Okay. Turns out the storyboards had enough content for a feature length film. And while I get why it had to be trimmed down, it's still a shame because this definitely would have elevated the fight into something insanely insane. But it's fine. We get contenders for the best sequences of the season with the Susano forming in the smoke, it chasing Aizen down, the fight between the funny dragons with the funny frame rate and the limbo clones, Madara giving a speech about how he loves to fight while surfing on the dragon and the shot of the two laughing like totally normal people. Dude, I love this fight. They even reference Madara getting his back blown out. That was a nice touch. And of course, we gotta get a fake death. We just gotta. Madara's fake death was awesome with the big purple madness, and Aizen's death was all right. But the ending shot of Madara on looking the meteors raining down on the Sunset Canyon with the final choirs of Hollow Dreams playing out. <laughs> Apparently, this fight was also somewhat controversial because of the supposed Aizen downplay. Yeah, sure, I'll pretend like I care. Seeing one of your most wanted episodes happen and it being so amazing? Yeah, I know, this is my win. See ya, nerds. Imagine at the beginning of this video, I was like, Death Battle Season 8 is a really good season, so much so that Dio vs. Alucard ended up as my favorite. Like, why would I do that? Goku Black vs. Reverse Flash. Oh god, another Dragon Ball vs. DC episode. Shit, 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 shit. Analysis, aka the reason why this episode isn't number one. It's not a bad analysis overall. Most episodes would wish for segments as good as Reverse Flash's analysis, and Goku Black's wasn't all rough. But good lord, they did that thing again where they just spurt out versus junk before they even talk about the character in question. But at least here it's like 
a little more forgivable. I can see it as an attempt to contextualize as to why wanting to steal Goku's body is a big deal by discussing the universe clash. Plus, it's not as calky as something like this, but it's still noticeable and kind of mid. Also, for some reason, in the conclusion, Wiz has a mini tangent about how Goku Black lost because he's not Goku. And like, Guys, we are well past Goku versus Superman 2. You don't have to try to save face by discussing how good of a character Goku is. It's only gonna make it more hairy. Anyways, batshit fight. You know we're in for a treat when the first thing we hear from them is referencing the It Was Me Barry meme. And they went all in on it by the fact that they casted the guy who made it into a meme to begin with. And even outside of all that, Valentine Stokes is phenomenal as Reverse Flash. It was the casting choice of all time. And Michael Kovach was amazing as Goku Black. He simultaneously captures the edginess of Goku's voice and the smoothness of Zamasu's voice. It's not one-to-one -one with Sean Chamel's, but it didn't need to be. It's just a great performance all around. Helps that he did this. Raw. And that's just the whole fight. There are scenes that didn't need to go so hard, but they did anyway. Goku Black's entrance. Thawne using a civilian as a meat shield. Goku Black punching Thawne through the earth and the moon and then doing it again. Said amazing Kamehameha sequence, them time hopping to various points in the fight to just kill each other over and over and over again, even going as far as to retconning Quicksilver's garbage death and made it less garbage. And that death too. Goku Black gets dragged across the earth a million trillion times, scream shaking, guttural scream, still not dead because of his rosé hair, or that might just be a minor animation error, but the common interpretation still goes crazy, as he gets tossed into the sun and the animation ends on a Supernova! Whew. And you know, it's one thing to have the craziest set pieces ever made, but it's also all the little itty bitty things that glues this fight together. I love how Thawne's immediate reaction to seeing a potential threat to the universe is to just mess with him. Thawne in general is his usual petty self, and it contrasts with Black's holier-than-thou attitude very nicely. It's not a common dynamic, but a very epic one still. I love how out of all the ways they can communicate Thawne's speed advantage, they have a jinx moment where they ask, why aren't you dead? But Thawne finishes his thought first. And when Thawne is sabotaging Flash versus Quicksilver, they time the custom track to where you can hear the lyrics, it was me as it was happening. These are moments where they seem almost too good to be coincidental, but given how amazing just about every aspect of it is, I'd believe it if you told me if it was intentional. And of course, new fight that uses time travel, new meme. You sure do? See it. Goku Black vs. Reverse Flash feels like an episode that wouldn't be a masterpiece if it was done any other season than this one. It feels like a huge passion project from everyone involved, and they meticulously crafted it to be as immaculate as possible. I wasn't into the matchup at first, but this episode made me love it immensely. And then there were one. Hmm. 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 Even when this season was fresh off the presses after it ended, there was nary a thought in my pea brain that this would have been my number one. Like I said, every episode at the top six up until now has had the ever so pristine honor of being called my favorite episode of season eight. Meanwhile, this one right here was just a really good episode and that's about it. At least, that's what I thought at first. Okay, let me put it like this. My top six could at least say it was the best at something, whether it was characterization, hypothetical moments, fan service, spectacle, insanity, or what have you. But the fact of the matter is, there's always gonna be something holding each of those episodes back. Goku Black vs. Reverse Flash could have stayed as my number one if it had a better analysis. Madara vs. Aizen? Well, if only it started off a little better. Link vs. Cloud? Analysis could have been better, and there's a few roughish looking parts. Saitama versus Popeye? Well, I'm just an ass clown. Yoda versus Mickey? Not everything held up as well over time. Meanwhile, Dio versus Alucard topped my list not because it has the best pieces, rather it has all of the pieces. All those other episodes had at least something holding them back. This one? I can nitpick. It breaks the 180 rule once. There's one shot where the background is noticeably blue. Alucard misses a few too many bullets for my liking. Alucard's zombie army is just a bunch of Marvel versus Capcom zombies and not incorporating any of the ridiculous hunters he's killed. This hand-drawn shot doesn't even change the background. This hand-drawn shot has a lower frame rate. That That's it. That's all my issues with the fight right there. And wouldn't you know it, who cares? And that's not even discussing the analysis where they cover so many bases, has amazing manga panel editing, had a lot of fun jokes, and strangely raw as hell lines like at the very end of Alucard's analysis and Dio going out like a bitch as they so put it. Boomstick turns Wiz into a giant beer can and slurps him up. I mean, hey, I've also seen Roshi versus Jiraiya. When's my turn? Anyways, you want me to discuss the positives about the fight? 
I may as well read the fandom article. I'm serious. It's awesome moment right after awesome moment right after awesome moment right after awesome moment. And it's almost four minutes long too. That's like feature length for modern death battles. But since it's so amazing, there's never a dull moment. I mean, if I have to list out the absolute best moments... <gasps> Dio using the time stop in front of the weapons shop to bring out the knives was a nice touch. They made the Dio line actually really funny by having him break character for a sec. This blood ocean shot. Dio and the world simultaneously fighting the zombie army. Alucard getting his own Hellsinger bridge meme by quoting his very first line of the series and making it sound sinister. Having a sword fight by using the clock's hands. Dio being the glizzy goat. Dio taking out the entire army in one laser. Alucard getting obliterated. And Dio's final re. I really did just list most of the fight, huh? I mean, what else do you want me to say? The aesthetic is really nice. Tom Schalk did great as Dio. Bringing Taka back to voice Alucard is the actual casting choice of all time. Hell Over Heaven being a shockingly amazing track, both in battle and as a solo listening experience. Them incorporating the funny meanie memes, not just for the funny factor, but out of respect for both series and their cultural impacts while also being completely badass. Them shoving in just about every single thing out of pure passion. Like, sorry for hardly reviewing this, but blame Death Battle for making a near flawless episode, not me. I gave this an 8 out of 10 on my first watch. And that was way too harsh. Look, if Liam Swan has an idea, let him cook. Dio vs. Alucard is a special kind of episode where in my video of me talking about death battle episodes, the last thing I want to do is talk about it. I just want to watch it. So I will. You can leave. And that was season eight all done and dusted. And you know, all I wanted from the last season going into this one was for it to be a good-ish season. Instead, they made it one of the best seasons the show has to its name. How about next time you give me what I asked for? Yeah, so, uh, best season, right? Sure, season six has my favorite individual episode of the entire show, but I always looked at each season in the bigger picture. And on that front, Season 8 has way more going on. It already gets a ton of bonus points for the matchups being way more compelling by design, and how they took the same bi-weekly release format from the season prior and compensated for all that by not making more episodes, but by making the standard 16 episode format better for it. And yeah, this is probably the most succinct explanation as to why most of the season slams as hard as it does. If the worst thing I can say about a specific episode is that it just wasn't very well put together, you must have done at least something right. Everyone brought their A game this season. Analysis writing was vastly improved thanks to more thorough character coverage and actually good humor for the most part. Every animator killed it this year. The 3D team had a smooth-ish transition to Blender, and the Sprite team, they're the best they'd ever been combining the Sprite characters with awesome environments and effects. I don't even know if we can really call these Sprite fights anymore, but eh, genre labeling's got a genre label. If there is actually one thing I can criticize the season for in the landscape of the Versus community, they got a little too excited for their lineup. At the end of season seven, they teased six combatants for six different episodes like they did for the season prior. Okay. Cool. All six of those episodes were during the first half, though, and during the break, they teased two more episodes, one featuring the character's fourth run back and the other outright revealing the 150th episode, and then they teased four more episodes, one of which was already confirmed in a fighter preview, and another where we knew both of the combatants again. Yeah, actually waiting for each episode wasn't the most engaging thing in the world. Three quarters of the season, we knew at least one combatant going in, and it's especially not great when you consider a majority of the teased combatants were very very easy to guess their opponent, making this whole legacy lineup selling point work against itself. I mean, don't say Death Battle can't do the impossible. But if the worst thing I have to say about this season is, golly, it sucks having to wait for these episodes. The most exciting thing this season did was prove that Death Battle is awesome. I had been a fan of Death Battle forever, and most of my friends enjoyed the show too in seasons one through two. Yeah, a lot, if not all of them, fell off at one point or another, which, I mean, I get it. The show's not for everybody, and especially the later bit of season two and pretty much all of season three was a rough time for the show. But, I'm stupid. I still watched when nobody I knew still would, which kind of technically made Death Battle somewhat of a guilty pleasure, but whatever. Season 8 gave me confident, concrete proof that Death Battle can still reach some of the same highs, if not higher, than their supposed prime era. And it's a season that means a lot to me. I started doing these goofy rankings during the Season 8 run and was around knee-deep into the community that expresses a similar love for the show like I do. My goal for these rankings wasn't just to provide my stupid opinion and be stupid on camera and kill myself, but to show at least one of my old friends that Death Battle is still awesome and didn't fall off in 2016. 
which it kind of did technically, but eh, oh well. I've seen people be like, oh hey, this show is actually pretty good, I want to watch it again. You know what? That's all I needed. I win in the end, baby! Well, you can get out now. Thanks for watching, boys. Hit all the funny buttons, sure, if you want to. And I want to give my special thanks to my dank channel members. Vinyl453, Alferia, and Wagonworks. I hope I'm pronouncing all of that right. <laughs> Join my channel membership if you want some epic perks and, more importantly, help my partner's college fund go straight to heck. You guys have been, like, freaking amazing, even just getting the word out. So, if there's anything I want you to take away from all this GoFundMe madness, is just that. And, fair warning, I will continue to be annoying about it until that goal happens. Now, wouldn't this have been an epic end to my death battle? ranking saga I'm staring at the light dude god